Hello and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat. And before we get into anything Pittsburgh Penguins, I have one massive pet peeve that I just want to get off my chest really quickly because it happened twice this morning mm -hmm. and it is 8.33 in the morning. Do not, I will repeat this again, do not hit both the up and down buttons when you're waiting for the elevator. You're slowing everyone down. And if you don't see that you're doing that, I just have to question your mental like capacity because you don't understand that you're also getting on when it's going up mm -hmm. and it's stopping for nobody when it's going down. So that, that irritated me. The fact that it's 8.30 in the morning and it's happened twice or what? Twice. I just had to get that off my chest before we, we got into any of the pens talk today. And the thing is like... You hit both, right? You're trying to go up, say. But the one that is going down arrives. Depending on the elevator you're in, we went to school at Point Park, where if you hit <laughs> down, that thing was going to the first floor before it started going back up again. Yeah. There are multiple occasions where we would be on the second floor trying to get back upstairs, where the down elevator would come and we'd go, you know what? At this point, it's easier to get on the elevator, go down a floor, wait for it to load up, and then go back up before waiting for the one to just go back up. Yeah, that that's a lot different when you consider that it is a, a five floor building that we stayed in, in, in Pioneer. And realistically, if you did wait for it to go down, you weren't getting on it on the way back up. Because a five floor building, there was one, one elevator there. But I was thinking of Lawrence, the... But with the four elevator terminal pretty much in the Yeah, exactly. There's four there's four elevators there. There's two elevators in my building and 13 floors. And people doing that at six in the morning mm -hmm. when there's literally nobody. So I'm not sure what you're so anxious about getting on the elevator for, like why you're in such a rush for that you have to hit the up and down button that you're genuinely slowing everybody down. I don't know. Uh I just needed to get that off my chest before anything that that got me off to a rough start today but we have plenty to talk about surrounding the Pittsburgh Penguins which is actually what people came here to listen about not my issues but uh we'll talk about Jeff Petrie because it looks like he might be able to return for the Pittsburgh Penguins tonight against the Detroit Red Wings we'll talk about some lineup shifting that Mike Sullivan did in practice yesterday at UPMC Sports Lemieux Complex we'll talk a little Taylor Fadoon we're going to play a game called Finish the Statement in the second segment, and at the end of the show, we're breaking, basically just going to give you the answer. Will the Penguins make the playoffs? Yes or no? Easy, easy question to ask, harder question to answer. But let's start with Jeff Petrie. He is considered a game-time decision tonight against the Detroit Red Wings. He took line rushes with Brian Dumlin yesterday on the second pair at practice. He's missed the past five games with lower body injury. Horwat, what does Jeff Petrie bring to this lineup? Once he officially returns, you know it's a sense of state, uh, sense of stability. It's a sense of commonality. It's not. I mean, we haven't been fully behind the uh, play of Jeff Petrie this season. It's not what we were all expecting, but it is at least uh, a face that has been in the lineup most of the season, right? It's not quick call-ups and Taylor Fadoon or replacement level guys and Mark Friedman and Chad Ruiel. It is an NHL ready defenseman who has been in that spot all year, right behind Chris Letang um, and has done enough. He's done well enough. He brings just an easy, okay, we're getting back to health kind of face. It's, I'm not, we're not expecting fireworks, right? It's not like he's going to bring the, he's, it's not like he himself is going to return to the lineup and the defense is all of a sudden going to be cured. Um, I think this is just a case of, He'll come back in the lineup and it'll be just a sense of familiarity again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the one word you use there, stabilize. Mm -hmm. It's what he's going to do for this Pittsburgh Penguins blue line. Because even though they've played fairly well over the past handful of games with four of their top six defensemen out, you can tell that they're playing and operating in a fashion that's not sustainable. Chris Letang is the main just culprit of that because... With Chris Letang, the reason that Jeff Petrie was brought in was to take a little bit of the pressure off of Letang and not force him to be out there in all three phases of the game for 30 minutes a game. Letang's season average of ice time is 24 minutes and 41 seconds. In the last five games with Petrie out of the lineup, 
it's 27 minutes and 45 seconds. So if anything, before we even talk about anything else, Jeff Petrie's return saves Chris Letang's lungs. Just It does, yeah. It's uh, the most it needs to do, too, right? Just <laughs> needs to just give Letang a little rest, cut those minutes down, keep them high, obviously, because they're going to remain um, – pretty increased i mean you said the average heading in was 25 24 41 yeah a little under 25 something around there yeah so when you anytime you go above that average it's a little interesting and i mean it's obviously run of the mill for crystal tang but i mean playing 27 49 against uh the capitals last game is it's quite a lot that's a Mm -hmm. big number like whenever we saw this defensive core get ripped apart uh with all these injuries all eyes kind of turned to Latang, going, all right, you're the one that's usually playing 20-plus minutes a night, time to play damn near 30. Nothing much we could do about it. That's just how the defense was going to roll. And I think, honestly, the most impressive part is is how um, P.O. Joseph has been able to take on an all-of-a-sudden elevated number of minutes and look decent, not, not phenomenal, but not bad. A couple of egregious errors here and there, but that'll happen. And – him playing 24-11 against the Capitals again, that's – I mean, what's his average been this season? Not that high, that's for sure. Hmm. 15. No. 15. Yeah. He's been averaging about 15-16 this season. Uh, ugh, yeah, so giving him an, a literal extra 10 minutes of ice time is not ideal. Yeah. But, uh, not that – you know, not that Petrie returning the lineup reduces uh, P.O. Joseph's numbers, but it- – it will slightly because yeah. you, you have to think that when Latang is out there a little less at five on five, so too will be his defense partner. But yes. at the same exact time, when you look at the way that Petrie is going to be able to come in, hopefully, and, and pick up the pace really quickly, because it seems like they've been taking their time on letting him come back. He's been kind of on the verge of returning for about a week now. So hopefully they've been waiting just to make sure that he is right and ready to go for the remainder of the season because he's been in and out of the lineup a little bit since the turn of the calendar to 2023. So the Penguins really need him to be a stabilizing presence, and for that to happen, he needs to be healthy. So hopefully when he returns, it's not going to be right away that he's up to speed because as with every other defenseman that has been out for the past couple of weeks, it is a lower body injury that he was dealing with. So hopefully he has his legs about him. But I think the most important part with him is the intelligence quotient. Like we brought him in and by we, I mean the penguins, they brought him in hoping that he would bring a smarter and more defensively responsible outlook on that second pairing. And right before his injury, you could tell he was chasing it a bit. I don't know why. I don't know why he was trying to be the hero. When you talk about who's going to be the hero on this team, Jeff Petrie should not be in the top five, top even maybe even top 10 of guys that are going to play hero for this team. He just needs to go out there, eat minutes, be good in the transition. And also he's been physical at points this season. I just need to see more of that in front of the net. That's what Brian Burke and Ron Hextall. That's why they completely restructured this defense because they wanted it to be stronger. They wanted it to be tougher to play against. And Jeff Petrie for most of the season, Hasn't been that tough to play against, especially in the net front. The Penguins are going to need that going down the stretch. And if they make the postseason, they're going to need that when they get there, too. Right. That was the uh, that was the criticism against Petrie. I remember earlier in the season was that he's not bringing the big body presence that he has and that he was expected to bring. Mm -hmm. Is he does he bring a large, you know, a large stout body to the team? Yes, but he's not. He wasn't utilizing it properly. Mm -hmm. Um, We kind of got away from that for a little while, but yeah, that's still an issue. The fact that that's not being uh, implemented into his game this year um, when it needs to be. I think we're not expecting him to be Mike Matheson because we know he's not. We're not expecting him to be fast on his skates, have some agility, but also uh, score score goals and move the puck like a forward. Um, But we haven't gotten what we're expecting, so Mm -hmm. it hasn't been ideal. Although he does just bring a a stable face to the to the blue line, and that's just all we've needed recently. Because his his presence will lower the minutes of Latang and then everyone around them. Yeah, yeah, I think that is the primary 
advantage of getting him back. I think the secondary one is that he should help the Pittsburgh Penguins break out right away. Like the second he comes in, he should help the Penguins break out because he doesn't rely really on his own legs for his style of breakout. It's his passing ability and his really his vision because he has better offensive instincts, in my opinion, and I think most people would agree, than Chad Ruedel. He has better offensive instincts than Taylor Fadoon, who we'll talk about in a second. So I think that immediately upon him coming back, he should be able to get the breakout going a little bit better than it has in the past couple of games, although it hasn't been awful. As we've talked about, the Pittsburgh Penguins have not had issues really defensively since all these guys went down, and that is a credit to the guys that have stepped in, whether that be P.O. Joseph getting in a much larger role like we talked about, whether that be Mark Friedman or Chad Ruweedle or Taylor Fadoon. Mm -hmm. So I do think that despite it not falling off a cliff like some people would expect, what do you say, four of your top six defensemen are injured? I do think that it's going to be a noticeable difference tonight if he's in the lineup, and especially on Thursday against the Nashville Predators in the Penguins breakout from the defensive zone. Yeah, it'll be noticeable. It'll be a stabilizing force and... I mean, that's the most we can ask for this year. <clears throat> Maybe a few extra helpers along the way, but... Yeah, the, the points total is down a little bit, but also you you have to realize that he was the number one defenseman, really, for the Montreal Canadiens, specifically last season. But even when Shea Weber was healthy and playing, he was the go-to guy for the top power play. He was the go-to guy for all the offensive zone face-offs. Shea Weber wasn't really that guy as much to the latter stages of his career in Montreal. So that's Petrie did take a step back as far as his role when he came to Pittsburgh, but you do hope that you get a little bit more than what 26 points is what he's has right now. Yeah. He's at 26. Now he had 27 all of last year in 68 games. So yeah, we are seeing an increase for sure, but you have to remember the team that he was on last year was a notoriously bad Montreal Canadian team. He was a minus 11. Yeah. So to really get comparison, you have to go back to the year before. I mean, it was the, the bubble here. It was the, all Canada division for him, but uh, and he played every game, 55 games for 42 points. I think Jesus. that's kind of more of what we were looking for, right? Yeah, I that's get, a 50 point defenseman. Yeah, like sure, we're playing a full 82, we're playing against every team in the league. It's not just game after game against the Maple Leafs who didn't really play defense that season. The very bad, who was very bad that year? Vancouver, Ottawa, Calgary, Ottawa. You're playing those teams over and over again. So it's a little different, but at the same time, Mm -hmm. you're still playing against Toronto. You're still playing against Edmonton and their shoddy defense. There wasn't (laughs) a lot of defense going on up there. Yeah, the North Division was not quite the the big brick walls on on the defensive side of the puck. Right, but um, still, you're looking at that on paper and going, that's a 42-point season, and he was a huge help to their playoff runs. Remember when the Canadians made the Stanley Cup final, ladies and gentlemen? That year. That year, he was a big help to that. Mm-hmm. So him and his bloodshot eyes. Yeah, and then the year before, he played hero. You talked about him, you know, not playing hero here. Well, he played hero before. He's yeah, we it. don't need that. We're not expecting we, him to, but no, he's done it before, and we're expecting more of the forty-point guy that we've getting. Because you go back to full eighty-two game seasons a few years prior to that, uh, he played eighty-two two years in a row in. Uh, 17, 18, 18, 19, scored 42, 46. That's what we were expecting, not 26 points. Mm -hmm. So Petrie rejoins the lineup. Who comes out for him? But uh, Taylor Fadoon, who honestly, he filled in really well as a defensive defenseman on the Penguins' bottom pairing. You didn't hear his name much, so it's the old Brian Dumlin measurement of how well a defensive defenseman played. You didn't hear him. For a long time, I was like, oh, wait, yeah, that's right. Taylor Fadoon is actually playing in these games. He just wasn't noticeable, which is a good thing. And he didn't play a whole lot of time. He averaged 11 minutes of ice time, but he played well when he was asked to play well. And let's not forget, he is the 11th defenseman in the Penguins organizational chart. If Ty Smith would have been healthy, he likely would have been recalled over Taylor Fadoon. So the 11th defenseman in your system played four games, had 56% of the shot attempts at five on five, 61% of the expected goals for, and then of course it was two goals for and two goals against for Taylor Fadoon in four games. I thought he played really well for what the Penguins needed from him in those four games. I wouldn't even say he's 11, actually. Because Ron Hextall said, well, Ron Hextall mentioned during, I think it was the press conference right after 
uh, the trade deadline where he said, uh, where, where he mentioned that he didn't plan on moving out any defensemen. Uh, he noticed a couple get hurt in the minors, which was Ty Smith and also Xavier Ouellette, who has been having, who had a, was having a great season until uh, he was taken out for the year. Mm-hmm. So I, we don't know because we didn't really see uh, Ouellette get a call before or really talked about until uh, his injury occurred. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's hard to tell. I also don't remember when it happened because we know Taylor Fidu has been called up before, but didn't play. So mm-hmm. I think I would even say maybe he's 12. I would say. Yeah. McStall at least maybe thinks that Ouellette could have been in, could have been in the NHL lineup before Taylor Fidun, which I mean, for the few games that uh, Fidun played perfectly fine. You could tell he wanted something while he was up here. He mm-hmm. was, um, joining rushes, he was taking shots every chance he could, and good for him. I mean, it's you know it's his first time in three years since the co- since the bubble playoffs, since the, he was on the Dallas Stars playing in the Stanley Cup Final, that uh, he was playing NHL games. Mm-hmm. So yeah, absolutely, take your chances, play smart hockey, and I mean, one of the questions he was asked during that first uh, uh, during after his first practice was, what keeps him in you know, in the game of hockey, he just loves the game. So good on him. I, as a person, he seems like a great guy and, you know, as a player, not the greatest, but, um, did okay. Did okay. in his time did what he needed to do. And that was play defense, be yeah. invisible for kind well, not be invisible, but, um, no, be invisible. You're, you're, you're spot on there. If you're invisible as a defenseman and you're not talked about, you're not mentioned on the broadcast and you still, when you go back and look at the score sheet, you played 11 minutes of ice time. It's not a bad thing. Not a right. bad thing at all. So honestly, not a bad guy to have in the organization. Like you said, a guy that just purely loves the game still. He's the captain of the wilkes barre Scranton Penguins. So he's down there just kind of pushing the youth, pushing the young guys and hoping to build those guys into somebody that will contribute to the Pittsburgh Penguins in the future. So shout out to Taylor for Dune. I-, I thought he played much better than, you know, I gave him credit for. I didn't know what to expect with Taylor for Dune coming into the lineup. All I saw was, and, you know, the move that happened right before that was Marcus Pedersen go down. So a lot of people were sounding the alarms, but Taylor Fadoon did a good job to to calm the presence for everybody and and hold down the fort. And now we'll see what's able to happen with uh, Jeff Petrie on the mend and hopefully getting back in the lineup later this evening. But we're going to take a quick break. When we return, Ricard Raquel drops down to the third line. Mikhail Granlund up on the second line. We'll break down that move next. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com, a proud partner of the hockey news. Make sure you check out InsideThePenguins.com for all the latest news and analysis for your Pittsburgh Penguins. I'm Nick Berlansky, that's Nick Horwat, and Mike Sullivan, as he's done all season long, just shuffling the lines a little bit, hitting the shuffle, heading over to the deck. And saying, you know what? We need a reset despite a massive win, but they needed something after that third period. You knew that they weren't going to be like, all right, well, let's ignore that. <laughs> let's just ignore that that happened and let's just move forward with the same exact thing. In his mind, one of the things that he could do was drop Ricard Raquel down to the third line and put Mikhail Granlin up on the second line with Evgeny Malkin and Jason Zucker. When asked about it after practice, one of the things that Sullivan highlighted was Granlin's defensive sensibilities, which, according to most statistics, don't exist. But uh, Mike Sullivan believes that Granlin brings a little bit more of a defensive aspect to the game. I don't know if he's confusing defense with actual penalty killing, because at five on five, those two things are, are very vastly different. But Raquel down to the third, Granlin up to the second. What do you think about the move or what? If there's any bonus to Mikhail Granlin's defensive metrics, Malkin and Zucker don't play a lot of time in their in their own zone. They do not. No, they really, really. don't. And getting, sometimes getting Petrie back is going to help that too. Yes, and sometimes they might. Sometimes Malkin has his little lazy shifts. You know, I forget which game it was. I remember just saying Malkin's just having one of his lazy games. Mm. Um, but this is a much 
different situation for Granlund where he's not going to play as much defense. So maybe the numbers will pick up and it'll be a, it'll be a case of, I told you so for Mike Sullivan. And yeah, uh, well, it'll also be, well, he's playing a lot less time in the defensive zone because you have to remember who he was playing with beforehand, kind of a mishmash of faces, obviously, but right now our third line consists of Ryan Paling and Danton Heinen along with Ricardo Kell, obviously who played well in that first experiment with him on the third line, although it was Nylander up on the second Mm-hmm. Um, I think I don't. Th- I don't think Granlin's going to be horrible on, in this no. situation. We know Raquel's going to be good wherever he goes, and this will be the true test of it, honestly, because he's not playing with Crosby or Malkin. Now it is Ryan Paling, mm-hmm. and that brings it's 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 the idea of bringing firepower to the depth, but it mm-hmm. not being Brian Rust, right? Yeah, and here's the thing with Brian Russ, too. There's an interesting conversation to be had about him because I feel like, and we'll get to this actually in the next segment, I feel like he's probably the worst of the top six forwards. Or top, well, yeah, no, top six forwards. I was going to say wingers, but forwards counts as well. Um, but dropping him when he hasn't played well is not really going to do too much to that third line. Adding Ricard Raquel, in my opinion, would also do more to push the play driving on that line. Heinen has shown that he can play drive. He's been on and off throughout this last stretch where he's been playing. And Ryan Paling had a gorgeous goal on Saturday, and you hope that he can build off of it. He's shown that he has offensive upside. So you're hoping that by surrounding Paling with Ricard Raquel and and, and Danton Heinen, that you elevate him to the top peak offensive level that he has, in which case that's a good thing. But with Mikhail Granlund, I just don't know if I expect him to actually mesh well with Evgeny Malkin. There were a couple instances on Saturday against the the Washington Capitals where those two were on the ice together. Mm -hmm. And there was one play specifically, and and a lot of people are going to know what I'm about to say, where it was Granlund and Malkin in the offensive zone. Granlund was just out of reach of the puck, but he was about to get to it before getting hit, and Malkin was open what had a great opportunity. Granlund doesn't get the puck to Malkin. It turns into a goal for the Washington Capitals, and you just have to think, what what happened there? Like, Granlund is not completing plays. He's not finishing plays. And if this is a move to try to spark something in Mikhail Granlund, it's not the time to do it, in my opinion. The time to have done it was when you had a little bit more of a stable ground. But they haven't had a stable ground since he's been here. So I'm not exactly sure what they're doing with Mikhail Granlund. I've been vastly disappointed in his performance since he came over uh, from the Nashville Predators. So maybe this will spark something in him i just feel like he is a player that doesn't complete plays he doesn't finish his opportunities and i'm not sure how well that's going to go with evgeny malkin and and jason zucker we'll see i think like i said defensively it's going to work out because he's not going to be playing as much defense yeah it's a matter of finding his offensive ability what was what was what was hextall's reasoning for bringing him in do we even remember no no figures. I, I don't I don't think any reason he gave actually would make any sense. So it's I'm not even gonna give credence to it at this point. Right. Because things I've noticed about Granlin since getting here is well, I mean in 12 games he has three points. His finishing ability is not there. Hmm. Um I, we brought him in to be a playmaker, I think. I think we wanted him to make passes and be a setup guy. So being a setup man for Malkin and Zucker, that could work if we just haven't seen him be a setup guy yet, right? I think that's also Mm -hmm. part of it. And also, he has hands of stone. That's another thing I've noticed. He cannot stick handle anymore. I don't know if he ever could, but he cannot right now. I noticed it a couple times in Washington. It was... He he tried to do something, and uh, it's going the other way. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I I don't know. I'm not I'm not going to knock this move yet. I want to at least see what it can be. Maybe it wakes something up in Grandland because now he's playing with, you know, an all-star caliber center in Evgeny Malkin. And also the, let's, uh, every time he goes on a cold streak, I go, all right, let's just tell it like it is. Jason Zucker's being streaky again, which yeah. I mean, he is, we can just say that, but it's a good, it's in the good, in a good way. You know what I mean? Maybe something wakes up in Grandland. Maybe. Maybe he finds Zucker a little bit. Maybe Malkin adds a little step. I'm not knocking this move until I see what it does. Uh, but I'm 
expecting Raquel to bring a lot of firepower to the third line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To, to sum up Mikhail Granlund's tenure so far with the Pittsburgh Penguins and what, <coughs> excuse me, what I think of him, I really feel like he's just a great value branded Carl Haglin. That's the price of like crate and barrel, right? Yeah. He, you're paying a lot of money for somebody who is, does everything that Carl Haglin did for the Penguins when they won a Stanley cup, except he does it a little bit worse. He's a little bit slower. He's a little bit older. He has a little bit less offensive ability. He has less finishing ability and he can kill penalties. Yeah. It's, it, it it's how I see him, and I might be wrong, and I might be off base with that, but that's that's what I see when I see Granlin. So we'll see how this works out. We'll see if this is actually the lineup tonight because you know maybe he was testing it in practice, but normally when Mike Sullivan tested in practice, he wants to test it in the game as well. Um, but let's move over and talk about a new segment that we're going to call Finish That Statement, Horwat. I have four statements here. I want you to finish each of them. I will as well. I won't make you do it by yourself. <laughs> and basically, we want you who is watching along on our YouTube channel at Inside the Penguins or listening wherever you get your podcast from. Leave a review with your answers or just leave a comment with your answers. Let us know how you would finish these four statements. First, if they make the postseason, the Penguins starting goalie for game one of the playoffs will be blank. Tristan Jari. I know what I said about Casey DeSmith and I know what I've said about Tristan Jari recently, but... I'd say you give Jari the start in the playoffs just because you know he's – you know what he can do. You know what he can be, and he does deserve the chance to be the starting goalie in the playoffs. Uh, he has the ability to steal games for you. He has the ability to possibly steal a series for you if you need to. It's just a matter of bringing it. It is a matter of showing it. It's a matter of doing it. And also, it's a matter of giving him a really short leash this year. If – if that helps, I don't know what our expectations are going to be heading into the playoffs, right? That's the other thing. We're probably going to slide in as an eight seed going up against the Boston Bruins. Uh, you're, you're, the cards are immediately stacked against you. So I don't know if, get, I don't know if the leash on our goaltender is going to matter. Mm. But if you have high expectations for everyone involved, and you should, uh, you have to have a short leash, short leash for Jari and maybe go with the Smith in game two if things fall. Like, that's how fast I mean. Like, that's how short. Yeah. So I'd say in game one, it's Jari's net and just as here we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting also because the Pittsburgh Penguins haven't really had an option the last two postseasons. Yeah. That's hopefully, depending on Jari's health, because we haven't seen him since that Colorado Avalanche game in which afterwards. He was deemed to have had an injury, hence the emergency call-up and Dustin Tokarski's probably cinema-worthy stretch to try to get to Dallas on time and failing. But uh, getting there before the end of the game, which we appreciate. But I do believe that he's if he's healthy, Tristan Jari is it. Like You, you can't start Casey yeah. DeSmith in game one of the playoffs if Tristan Jari is healthy. If you do, you're basically admitting that Tristan Jari is not worth re-signing. And I yep. do believe that he is, and, and you do as well. We had that discussion before. So if he's healthy, and I think he'll be healthy for that game, Tristan Jari will be the starter for game one of the playoffs if the Penguins are able to clinch their 17th straight postseason berth. Let's move on to the next one. We're starting with the blank this time. Blank will be a catalyst for the Penguins' bottom six. <laughs> I like how I kind of mentioned it already in saying Ricard Raquel, uh, just mm -hmm. because process of, oh, he's there. Because yeah. no yeah, one now else is there. Yeah, because no one else has been a catalyst. I, Ryan Paley might kick something off, but uh, he's always going to have that funk of fourth line center to him, at least for the rest of this season, right? Next year we go in, it's a fresh start. Uh, maybe he's bumped up, but he's going to have that funk of fourth line center on him. He always will this year. There's nothing I can do about it. It's nothing he can do about it. Uh, man, Dan Heinen's Dan Heinen. I think we're past this experiment. Yeah. Um, Josh Archibald's a ton of fun. Drew O'Connor still can't finish. <laughs> Jeff Carter is Jeff Carter. So if Ricardo Raquel stays in the bottom six, I'm going to stick with him because I also don't know how Nylander makes his way back in the lineup if he hasn't already. Yeah, if, he, if Nylander wasn't able to get in at this point, you just got to mm -hmm. understand that impending another injury, 
Alex Nylander is probably not getting back in the lineup anytime soon. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but uh, who knows? My answer for this is Ryan Paling, though. Uh, okay. Yeah, Ricard Raquel would be great. I just don't think Ricard Raquel is going to be in the bottom six for very long. I don't think that's something that's going to last. Yeah. So and, I'm going to say Ryan Paling because you saw what he could do at his best on, on Saturday. Beautiful goal against the Caps that showed off that he has the foot speed to race people down. He has the finish ability in him and he has a really good shot, like a sneaky good shot. And what did we say when we first saw Ryan Paling in person back in training camp? This guy oh. likes to shoot the puck. Oh yeah. Th this guy likes to shoot the puck. A lot of times he wasn't passing. He wasn't overpassing. Now maybe the, the Mike Sullivan system has gotten into his mind through six months of playing in it, but he's was a shoot first guy when he came mm -hmm. to Pittsburgh and he was a guy. Let's not forget that scored three goals in his NHL debut with the Montreal Canadiens. So <laughs> he has a scoring prowess. Yeah. And I think the biggest issue with Paling all season long has been he hasn't been able to stay healthy long enough to find consistency. And when he has been healthy, he's been playing with guys that are not offensively capable. Most of the time it was Bluger Archibald. Then it was Carter. Now it's him with Ricard Raquel. With mm -hmm. Danton Heinen, there's a lot more offensive opportunity with him and his wingers. So I feel like Ryan Paling is going to be the catalyst for the Pittsburgh Penguins' bottom six. You know, he was he would have been my second answer, and mm -hmm. you know, probably the one B answer to to Raquel being my one A just by sheer. It's funny that they put Raquel there because it. Thinking about it, it putting Raquel in Grandland spot feels like Mike Sullivan Galaxy branding something, right? Because yeah. you just said it there. The third line is now a defensive a pretty much defensive minded for center surrounded by Dan Heinen, who everyone keeps saying has a great shot. Well, that's, that's great. Let's see the finish and Ricard Raquel, who we know exactly what he is. We've seen it all season. This is just Mike Sullivan galaxy branding a third line together and going, okay, this year's HBK line go. Yeah. Right. That's essentially what he's trying to do. And nothing against that. That's if it works, it works. There's nothing wrong with it. If it doesn't work again, just like Jari short leash, this, Bring it back, reel it in, and just kind of roll with what you got. Some mm -hmm. something found success at some point this season. You just got to somehow find that again. Best of luck. Yeah, uh, I mean the thing for for Paling is that he's clearly the best option for the Pittsburgh Penguins at third line center. Yeah. I know that by process of elimination, there aren't very many other guys that could actually challenge him for that position, but. I feel like so far he's taken it and ran with it. Let's hope that he continues to build on it and improves as the season comes to a close, but let's move over to the next one. Blank has been the best winger for the penguins this season or what, who has been the penguins best winger in the 2022, 23 season so far. Uh, I got to roll with Jake Ensel. I know Jason Zucker's had his season, but like I said uh, earlier, he, let, let's just be honest. He's a streaky goal scorer sometimes. He hasn't scored in how many games is it now? Seven. Mm. It's a lot more than we would have expected from him. I think he had another stretch similar to that not too long ago. Uh, so we got to go Jake Gensel. We know he says he has, hasn't had a great season. Well, he's looked damn good this year, regardless. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's just not what we all expected. Me, you and Hunter had this conversation. Yeah. Uh, but in 69 games, he has 66 points. I don't think we can be angry at that. No. Right? No. So no. I would say Jake Gensel has been our best winger this year. Raquel's been great. Uh, like we mentioned, Jason Zucker's been great. It's just a matter of finding the consistency. And uh who am I missing? Am I missing Brian someone? Rust. Oh, Brian Rust, who will what the hell happened to him? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh when looking at Jake Gensel's season, Josh Yoey put together a really good piece on it over at the athletic i believe it came out yesterday on monday uh so definitely check that out if you subscribe to that platform um but in my opinion the best winger for the pittsburgh penguins this season has been ricard raquel uh his ability to seamlessly transition roles has been really undervalued and underrated this season and we're seeing it once again from first line to second line now down to the third line he plays on the penguins top power play unit he has been really the Swiss army knife for Mike Sullivan's forward lineup. He's shown tremendous stick handling. Cause we always knew he had that. And his vision in the offensive zone is something that has really made him look really good 
with Jake Gensel and Sidney Crosby, when those three are together, it's like the Harlem Globetrotters. And Ricard Raquel is a big reason for that because finding two guys that have that kind of chemistry and Crosby and Gensel is, is great. It's phenomenal. But getting that third piece of the puzzle to be just like that and to fit in in the way that Raquel is able to just morph into the position that he's in, it's been really good for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And actually, the one thing that has surprised me the most, he's more physical and a better grinder down low than I, I even expected. Like, I didn't know that was part of his game when he came over from Anaheim. And he really didn't get the opportunity to show it last season in that short stint after the trade deadline. But this season you're seeing... He's physical on the forecheck, and when he gets the puck possession down low, him and Sidney Crosby can go to work below the goal line. And it's really impressive when he's able to do it at the level that he is able to do it. Like, Crosby is one of one. Nobody can touch his puck protection ability behind the goal line. But Ricard Raquel is up there. Like, he is performing extremely well in the tough areas, which is something I didn't expect to see. Yeah, that's fair. I wouldn't have expected to see that either. I mean, he's also coming from a team notorious for not playing the potty that often in Anaheim. Yeah. At least recently. I mean, the Corey Perry and Ryan Getzlaff years. Huh. Or at least how they won a Stanley Cup. Yeah. Uh, those are a little different. And even in the later Getzlaff years, you know, it wasn't that sort of uh, grind you down kind of game. So we didn't know he had it because he was coming from a team known for not having that. Yeah. So we just assumed he was one of those guys. Uh, now he comes in and has that, and that's – Hey, you know what? It, that's an added bonus. It's an added throw in. And um, yeah, I, I can't disagree with Raquel being the best uh, winger this year either. Cannot disagree mm -hmm. with that. <clears throat> yeah. And I can't disagree with Jake Gensel. So what, what I want to do before we move over to the next finish that statement, and we don't have to give our explanation, but rank the rest of the wingers. I have Ricardo Raquel at number one, but then I would put Jake Gensel at two, Jason Zucker at three, Brian Rust at four. And then I put Drew O'Connor in that conversation because even though he doesn't have finish, we talk about how little opportunity young players get from Mike Sullivan. Drew O'Connor has broken that mold. He's broken through. He's not coming out of this lineup and Mike Sullivan trusts him, which means he's not coming out of this lineup till he's 40. So <laughs> I, I really like what Drew O'Connor has done. I, I can't just give him enough credit for the way that he's been able to play that even though he's not scoring, He's playing extremely good hockey. And right now he's lifting Jeff Carter to actually get some decent numbers at five on five. So I give him all the credit in the world. So I would put Gensel at two, Zucker, Rust, and Drew O'Connor as my uh as my top wingers. I'd have to agree with that order. Yeah. Except yeah. flop the, the top two. Obviously correct. Yeah. I yeah. mean, Drew O'Connor, aside from that finishing ability, I mean, we've we've seen him gain the trust of Mike Sullivan. We've seen him play pretty well and uh, maintain uh, a pretty steady presence in the lineup. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd have to agree. Yeah. And the last one, I want to get one last uh, finish the statement before we move over to our weekly pens poll, which we haven't done in several weeks. Uh, my bad. Uh, the Penguins will win a playoff series. If blank. If blank. Oh, I could fill that. I could put all kinds of stuff in that one. <laughs> if blank, if Tristan Jari is healthy and steals the show. If Sidney Crosby plays as hungry as he has been this season. Hmm. Uh, and if one of the two bottom six lines, bottom, if one of the two bottom two lines does something. Yeah. Not both of them waking up, not, uh, Jeff Carter specifically, not Danton Heinen specifically, if one of those two lines wakes up and not even does everything, but wakes up and does something. This team gets mm. pushed over the edge, man. This top six is phenomenal, especially when the, both of those top two lines are rolling. This team can be really good. I mm -hmm. also left out the defense. It's a lot of things that need to go right for this team to win a round. But yeah, they're, they're deeply flawed, yes. Yes, but uh, the big ones have to be Tristan Jari waking up and doing the thing. Mm -hmm. and Sidney Crosby just remaining and succeeding as hungry as he has been. Mm -hmm. I'd say those are the two big ones. We can get back. You can win a round with a top six. Mm -hmm. You can't win multiple, but you can win a round with a top six. Mm -hmm. You can win a round with a flawed defense, kind of, sort of, unless you're playing Boston, but we can see what happens. Yeah. I think, and I keep throwing Boston out there because that's the expected, right? 
Mm-hmm. But at the same time, if we get a team like Carolina or New Jersey, probably Carolina as they start to pull away, we've played them close. We've been here mm-hmm. before. Yeah, We could steal a series. It's possible. It's very possible. Mm-hmm. I'm going to preface my finishing of the statement by saying, obviously, the Pittsburgh Penguins need to play more so along the lines of the way they play the last three games. Like, obviously, they need to play well. Obviously, they're going to need Crosby. Obviously, they're going to need Malkin. And they're going to need the defense to not be horrible. That Mm -hmm. much is clear. But what is going to push them over the edge? The Penguins will win a playoff series if whoever is in net has a save percentage of 9-10 or higher. We've talked about it ad nauseum. The league average now is around 907, 908 to 910. Jeez. If you get 910, if you even get 905 save percentage, I give the Pittsburgh Penguins a fighter's chance at getting out of the first round this year. Look at the last two years. We always say goaltending killed them in, in the last two playoffs. Louis DeBing last postseason had an 898 save percentage, and the Pittsburgh Penguins lost in seven games and to the New York Rangers <laughs> to the New York Rangers a team that went to the Eastern Conference Finals the Penguins went seven games with a goaltender that played the majority of the series going 898 <laughs> Tristan Jari in 2021 against a New York Islanders team that went to the Eastern Conference Finals they went six games against that team with Tristan Jari having an 888 save he, percentage he couldn't stop a beach ball he couldn't so if you give me 9-10 or higher from, I don't care who it is, 9-10 or higher, the Penguins are going to win a playoff series. Jeez. Yeah. I, <laughs> I didn't realize it was that low and he won three games. Yep. Oh, Louis Domingue. What a- well, he really won two, didn't he? Because, you know, the Smith uh, played, played most game, of game one. <laughs> he played basically a whole game, didn't he? I thought it was like the second overtime or something. He Yeah, he did play... It, he played a good portion of a game, but in, really, does Smith played the majority of it? In three overtimes, Louis Demi. Oh, he played sixteen minutes. Okay. Yeah, he played okay. almost a period. Uh, was credited with the win though, so he won three games. He won three. Okay. You know, <laughs> if you want to go into the NHL's stat keeping, then yes, I guess he won that game. Even though DeSmith probably deserves more of the credit. Although, you know, I don't know playing hockey with the spicy pork and broccoli in the stomach. Smith also gave up three. Louis Deming gave up zero. I mean, obviously, well, but no anyway. shit. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. That being um, said, that uh, he being won three said, games with that yeah. safe percentage, hilarious. At the end of the day, though, give me it, give me a nine oh five or better. Yeah, a- and they might be able to actually compete. Give me a nine ten or better. I think they win a playoff series. But that's the end of uh, finish that statement. Like I said before the segment started, make sure you give us your answers. Put them in the comments below on YouTube. Give us a review and and comment what your answers are in the review. Uh, But thank you so much for for tuning into that portion. We have one segment left, our weekly pens poll. I've been forgetting to put them out. I almost (laughs) forgot to talk about it, Uh, but we will right after this break. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by Inside the Penguins, which is a website, which means it says .com at the end of that. Uh, So the Pittsburgh Penguins right now, I'm not going to say sitting pretty in a playoff position, but if the season ended today, they'd be in the playoffs, which is uh, prettier than it has been at times in recent weeks. The question we asked, plain and simple, and we're going to give you an answer here in the next five minutes. Will the Penguins make the playoffs. I completely forgot to update it after I wrote the results of this poll from last night. So I'm going to go look it up. Horwat, what is your answer? Will the Penguins make the playoffs? Uh, Yes. Yes, they will. I think it's at the point where we just need a couple of games here and there to go the right way. We got a perfectly timed win against the, <clears throat> against the Capitals where both the Islanders and the Panthers lost in regulation creating that separation. The Panthers lost again, by the way, last night. Uh, the I Panthers, Yeah, the Panthers that were once surging are now on a four-game cold streak. 
uh, if they're not careful, the Buffalo Sabres might creep up on them and mm-hmm. you know, not fight for the playoff spot, but take them over in this running. Uh, as for the Islanders, we again have two games in hand. I think we lose one tonight, though. Mm-hmm. But um, the Islanders continuing to have played far more games than anybody else is hilarious on NHL scheduling part. Way to go. Um, But I think we have a golden opportunity. We still need to win games. Obviously, this isn't cut and dry that we're in. We need no. to actually succeed here. We need to pull points from Detroit. We need to pull... I'm not going to say easy, but we need to pull points from Nashville. And then what? It's Boston, Philly, Jersey again, Minnesota, Detroit again, Chicago, Columbus. There's the rest of our schedule, guys. Yeah, it really is a relatively softball schedule. Yeah. Yeah, and apparently the Islanders don't have an easy schedule coming up. I don't know what Florida looks like. Uh, the, I mean, they have The Penguins have the easiest schedule among those three teams remaining. Good. And I can tell you that much. Yeah, and that's a proper step in the right direction for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Florida is off today. They go to Toronto, Montreal, back-to-back nights, uh, Wednesday, Thursday. And they close out. Oh, their last two games are Toronto, Carolina. Yeah. And games that you need, that they probably need to win, mm-hmm. odds are Toronto and Carolina are resting players by then. But, poof, best of luck. So they have a tough schedule coming down the pike, and two of them being like that. Not ideal for uh, Florida. Yeah, the Pittsburgh Penguins, more so than basically anybody else except the Islanders, control their own destiny. And even more so than the Islanders, because the Penguins win their games in hand. Mm -hmm. They're ahead of the Islanders in the standings to get that wild card one spot, which if you want to avoid Boston, that's what you need. Our uh, Twitter poll results, now that I actually have them up in front of me, it did change since I put them in last night. 92% say yes. We're a confident fan base again. Yeah, there's confidence. And when you beat the Washington Capitals, that usually happens. Uh, The Penguins are a confident fan base. And realistically, considering the fact that they're getting Jeff Petrie back, Tristan Jari looks like whatever injury he sustained against the Colorado Avalanche is not severe as he backed up on Saturday against the Caps. So you hope that it's not severe. And the Penguins, like we said, have the easier schedule, and control their own destiny for the playoffs. They've been playing well over the past week. You hope that continues against Detroit tonight, a team that you can really just put a dagger in. I know Detroit has an outside chance, but you can really put a dagger in then if you beat them in regulation in Detroit at Little Caesars Arena. And then realistically, the Penguins, with the way that Crosby and Malkin have been playing and will continue to play, as we all expect, over the next two weeks, it's hard to deny them a spot in the postseason. Yeah. So where things stand as of right now, you mentioned it. The Islanders lead the pack, but have 75 games played. They have 85 <laughs> points. The Penguins are three points behind them with two games in hand. And then the Penguins have a three point buffer and a game in hand on the Florida Panthers right now for that first spot out five points ahead of Buffalo, five points ahead of Ottawa, six points ahead of Washington and 11 points. Like I said, ahead of the Detroit Red Wings, which tonight would nail in the coffin and their chances really. Uh, Not mathematically, but spiritually. Yeah, sure. Um, So the Pittsburgh Penguins are in a good spot. I think they make the playoffs. You think they make the playoffs. 92% of our poll voters think they make the playoffs. So the confidence from the writers of this podcast and the hosts of this podcast and the people that listen to it say the Pittsburgh Penguins are going to make the playoffs. And you know what? When everybody's in, in unison, everybody's on the same page. If I'm a sports better, I go the opposite direction. Mm. But if I'm thinking, and I'm not just trying to go against people because that's my mindset, which a lot of people are, I think the Penguins make the playoff this year. The, ne- the next question has to be, do they win a round? And that's, that when, is the, a, that's when philosophical responses, that's when no, this, that, and the other happens. No, and... no philosophical responses. Nine, ten, say percentage or better. I told you that about ten minutes ago. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it's a whole conversation. We're going to have the conversation at least four more times before the playoffs kick off. Yeah, we right? have. And then we'll we have, have it. We have four more episodes before the end of the season, so I'm sure we'll say it four more times. We have at least four more before the end of the season. Yeah, I think four anyway. or five. Regardless. And then sure enough, we're going to, once the Penguins are in the playoffs, uh, what are we going to discuss? All right, here's what we have to do to win a round. Here's what we have to do to, let's say we win a game. Here's what we have to do to continue that momentum. Mm-hmm. Man, it's it's the exciting time of year. And another thing to all the fans that say they're not going to make it or don't want the team to make it, 
thought of this while mm, go ahead. I thought of this while I was uh writing up a story on why this team should make the playoffs. Um and will. Uh what in in what world are you a fan of a sports team and want your team to lose? Even in your tanking years, you shouldn't want that. Because you could because at least in your tanking years. You can still want your team to win. You just know they're not going to. Mm -hmm. So you should never want your team to lose. Never. Never. That's why you are fans of the team. You want to see your team win. You want to see your team be successful. You know what's Mm -hmm. a hell of a lot more fun than losing? Winning. And also, guys, the people who keep saying that the Penguins don't deserve the playoffs, have you ever been to a playoff game? (laughs) 17 straight years, you've had plenty of, you've had ample opportunity to do it. They're fun. Mm-hmm. They're so much fun. Did you go to the game on Saturday? It's like that, but higher. But with actual meaning. Well, there, there was a lot of meaning in that game. You know what I mean. Yeah, but he, he, here's my opinion on that, because I see it happen a lot on social media. There's people that will say, you know, they don't deserve the playoffs. I want them to lose. They should tank. And then I see them take a picture. Hey, I'm at the game. Mm -hmm. are you there hoping that they lose did you pay money to watch them lose no so then you're a hypocrite and you're trying to be cool online don't you spending spending your honest opinion online and if your honest opinion is i want them to lose and i want them to miss the playoffs you shouldn't go to the game because then you're just contradicting yourself and there's nothing worse in this world than a hypocrite are you spending egregious amounts of money on beer just to want to want your team to lose yeah take out a mortgage just to be able to get drunk at a penguins game yeah, being sad drunk? Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like no. I said, only thing wor- the, the only thing worse than a hypocrite in this world is a person that hits the up and down button on the elevator. So full <laughs> circle on this episode. But thank you so much for tuning in to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. We will be back on Thursday with a full episode. If you want more Penguins content between now and then, you can either check us out at InsideThePenguins.com. Horwat and I will each have plenty of things and plenty of articles up on that site. We will also have a new episode of Penguins to Go out tomorrow, probably reacting to tonight's game or any of the storylines that happen in tonight's game against the Detroit Red Wings. We are closing in on 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. Or what? Did you know that? Yeah. 980 when I last checked. 20 away from the big 1K. So help us get there. Maybe we'll do a giveaway. We have to check the funds, Ooh. check the finances, and we'll have to see uh, see what we can do in that aspect once we hit 1,000 on YouTube. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.